Talladega. I think that's a uh, Alabama Indian for speed, <laughs> high speed, big crowds, huge excitement. And why would it be anything less? When Bill France built this speedway in the late 1960s, that's what he was thinking. And we're about to practice the Monster Energy cars. First of two sessions today. A few puffy clouds, and it's a little cool, but it's going to get to the low 70s today. Track temp 98 degrees. Great day to put cars on track and go fast. So welcome to Talladega. Jeff Gordon, Darrell Walter, Mike Joy to bring you through two rounds of practice today. Qualifying tomorrow, impound race, and race on Sunday. You were telling me on the ride, <laughs> on the bumpy ride over here, thanks, Jimbo, geez, that on race morning, you wake up and you're already a nervous wreck here. I, it, it's just, this place just does that to you. It's the anticipation. I mean, we could sit here and watch this race run lap after lap and with nothing happening, but things almost happen. And that almost happening is what gets you all excited because you're just, I don't want to be over, I don't want to oversell this, but you're just waiting for the big one because you oh. know it's lying, you know it's out there. When's it going to strike? And that's what keeps you up on the edge of your seat and keeps on your feet all day. So what's it like here, Jeff, to drive right on the edge of success and disaster? Yeah, that's how close it is. One move. One move is all it takes, one split-second decision, and all of a sudden you're in the middle of disaster. And sometimes it's not your move. No. It's somebody else's. I think they've been anticipating this weekend since Daytona. Daytona was chaotic and crazy. Right. And we know this place is wider. There's more opportunities for more chaos. Uh, I think that um, they better hold on tight for, for this one on <laughs> Sunday. And we will, too. Down to the garage, Vince Welch. Well, another thing that makes it interesting being here at Talladega, and we experienced this somewhat at, at Daytona as well, the no ride height rule, which is new to NASCAR, has really opened up the book for these crew chiefs. There's a lot more they can do with these cars here than in the past. Brad Keselowski, the last time the Cup cars ran at Talladega back in October, he was the winner here. In fact, no active driver is more successful on the plate tracks or at Talladega than Keselowski. Five plate wins five times here at Talladega. But this season, they've been off a little bit in speed on those mile and a halfs, and for that reason, this is a very important race for them. They feel like they can come here and win, and maybe this year more than recent years, they need a win. Thanks, Vince. Uh, Brad strapping in as a couple of cars are already lined up and ready to roll, led by the man going for four. KFC. The track is open for practice. You don't see Kyle Busch. You saw him in that line when we went to break because he's already gone. He is out there and getting up to speed. Mike, you know, we talk about cars bottoming out. We usually talk about in the front. I'm not so sure these things aren't going to bottom out in the rear. I don't think I've ever seen, well, I know I haven't, ever seen how low these cars the, yeah, are. The tips of the quarter panels are what are going, going to fold up a little bit. That's how low these cars are already. Look at that. Look at Kyle Busch, how low that tip is in the left rear. It's definitely going to drag the racetrack. All right, so we know the idea is to get the back end low and get the spoiler out of the air so it does not create a lot of drag. But what does that have to do with now the rear quarter panels behind the wheel reaching almost all the way to the ground? Well, that, that, that's, uh, that's, that's side force. And so what you lose in other areas, you gain back in side force. When the car goes in the corner, those big flat side sides sealed off to the racetrack are like a big board going around the corner. It'll make the car corner really well. And the biggest difference is they used to look like this in the corner. But when they get to the straightaway, they would pop up. Uh -huh. Now they're just the same height all the way around the racetrack. Look, look, just look at that. <laughs> I mean, I've never, I've been coming here a long time, never seen anything like that here. And this is why these cars are so unstable in the draft, Larry. Yeah, just one thing to remember here in Daytona, when it comes to the rear bumper and even wrapping around to the wheel openings, there is an added part that NASCAR mandates they run here. And it's just one of several things that's part of a package to keep these cars from locking bumpers it, it because it actually keeps air from 
flowing into the to the radiator opening in the car behind. So it's a much longer extension on the rear bumper and the back of the quarter panels than say last week at Richmond, next week at Dover. Right, Larry. Look at the height of that bumper face that you saw on Ryan, on uh, Ryan Blaney's car, the back bumper face, and it's designed to do just that, keep air from getting to the car behind and, and, and to cool it. And now that NASCAR has seen what these teams are doing, how they're being so aggressive with the ride heights here at Daytona and Talladega, they, I wouldn't be surprised if they do something different with this in 2019. Yeah, but this, Mike talked about the rear bumper. You can see the extension if you look at the rear bumper of these cars that's been added, I think it's about an inch or an inch and a half that have been added to the bottom of the rear bumper. I don't think with this ride height rule, that thing will stay on there very long. Well, you said something I, I found really interesting. We had a chance to sit down with Ricky Stenhouse, talk to him for a while, and you said these cars are now backwards from the way we <laughs> used to run them. They are. The, rear, the, the, the rate of the rear springs is now in the front. The front springs are in the rear, and it's like you got the whole car backwards. Oh, yeah, we used to so run expand like, on that. like three, 350, 400 pounds springs in the rear. And now they run them in the front. We used to run 12, 1,500 pound springs in the front. Now they run them in the rear. They've just taken the car and the setup and totally reversed it all because of arrow. When it, when it tried to get the arrow platform uh, where, it, where it's at its max. Hey, Larry, I expected us to see a, a lot of drafting in this first practice, but um, we're seeing single car runs. Is that because they want to get their heights right before they go draft? Well, uh, again, this is the first time we've been here, Jeff, with this no rod height package. We've only run it at Daytona as far as our restrictor plate tracks, and we know things are totally different here than Daytona, so I truly believe that's what they're doing. They want to get these heights right, but I think when they feel good about that, we will see a big package out there. I just think they have to since we've never run this package here. All right. Vince has more. Yeah, I think we will see that an, uh, at some point during this practice. Keep in mind two practices today, but they're both relatively short, less than an hour. In relation to what uh, Larry Mack was talking about there, too, the 18 plan, Kyle Busch coming in here with three straight wins. They wanted to run four laps right out of the gate just to shake it down. Then they were going to come in and get a full uh, pit road uh, to check the lights and to make sure that everything is uh, good for them is uh, in that regard as you look at Adam Stevens, the crew chief for Kyle Busch. So a little bit of a shakedown and introductory for the 18 and then they're going to really get to work and start working on that checklist. Thanks Vince. Now we've seen a lot of multicolored cars over the years <laughs> like this one. I have never ever seen a plaid race car until today. Well it's a fast plaid race car. Well that helps doesn't it? <laughs> You're going to be different. You better be fast. He's plaid out. He's the top of the chart. <laughs> 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 Cue the bagpipes. <laughs> one thing about plaid, hey, it's one, fast. That's one way Rick right there. <laughs> Truck driver. <laughs> Vince? You know, it's interesting. Uh, the, the scheme of the four with the plaid uh, paint scheme and then the uh, crew members all wearing the plaid as well as it relates to Bush and kind of their outdoorsman campaign. But it's interesting. One of the crew guys said it's the first time in 20 years that I've come to the garage with my shirt untucked. But that's <laughs> the look for this uh, for this outfit is to have the jeans on and the untucked shirt as the outdoorsman would wear his flannel. But he said it's been the weirdest thing having my shirt untucked. Now, Russell says flannel was created in the 17th century. That's the 1600s to replace plain wool garments. All right, so much for sartorial splendor. Back to the track. <laughs> yeah, now, hey, we got a pack of cards here. Looks like you guys are hooking up and uh, going to do a little, little drafting, which I like to see. Now the Childress cars at the front of this group, Jimmy Johnson. Now, Jimmy, we have usually seen just do lonely single car runs at Daytona and Talladega. Not, not here, not well, today. When it works, you do it. When right. it stops working, you stop doing it. I think also when you look back to Daytona, how important the way the car drove and how unstable these cars were in the draft. I think it's very important for a lot of teams to feel like they need to get out there and let's see what these cars are going to drive like this is uh, an impound race, right? So we want to know how aggressive we can get and still be able to drive the car in the race. Finding that out right now. Now top of the chart is Trevor Bain, who certainly was in the headlines this week 
as Roush Fenway Racing announced that Matt Kenseth will join that team and will drive the six car in selected races. Uh, Bain went, met with the media briefly today, and um, although he did not take questions, he said, uh, Trevor Bain said, my health is 100%. My desire is still as it always has been. Come to the track every weekend, contend for wins, and be a driver at the top level in the Cup Series. Nothing there has changed. So he will still be in the six car. Uh, the schedule has not been announced. Which races he will run, which races Matt Kenseth will run as Matt returns to the track that gave him his Cup championship, brought him to prominence uh, in the Cup Series. Roush, now Roush Fenway Racing. Mike, I... I I think Jeff will agree. I've seen drivers, it's almost like a wake-up call. You think you're doing all you can do. You're doing the absolute best job you think you can do. Then you get something like what happened to Trevor Bain this past week with Matt Kenseth coming over there to help drive that car some. That's a wake-up call. Okay, i got to step up my game. I don't know what I've got left in the tank, but whatever it is, I've got to use it now to prove to these people that I'm not the problem, that we need to work on our cars. And Trevor Bain's a fantastic young man, represents the sport, represents the sponsors very well. But if you have the opportunity to get Matt Kenseth to come over and help your organization get back to where they once were, you take it. I agree, Jeff. I mean, that's a no-brainer. He can come in. He's been on the outside looking in. And, and I think he and Mark Martin and Carl, Greg Biffle, all those guys, they still have a real affection for, for Jack Roush. If they could come over there and make a difference, and that's what a driver always wants to be able to do, go somewhere where I can make a difference. Matt Kenses can make a difference in that operation. Here's a guy that makes a difference riding on board there with Kyle Larson. Going to go to the back of this pack and uh, see if he can't work his way forward, makes a pass to some kind of car he has. And, and to finish off the story of Matt Kenses returning to Roush Fenway Racing, Mark Martin was very prominent uh, in the announcement uh, and in the events that led up to bringing Matt Kenseth back into the fold uh, at the team where he started. And after all, it was Jack Roush that resurrected Mark Martin's career back in the day and brought it back to cup racing with great success coming oh so close to a championship. And Mike, I was really disappointed that Mark didn't get more credit for Brooker in that deal. Because Jack loves Mark, Mark loves Jack. And I'm sure when Mark went to Jack and said, look, we can get Matt to come over here and help us, help us. And I'm pretty sure Jack probably didn't know if that was a great idea or not, but Mark sold that deal. Mark Martin should get the majority of the credit for putting that deal together, in my opinion. I believe Kansas will be Matt's first race in the car. Trevor racing it here and at Dover and at selected races throughout the rest of this season. And a great opportunity for Trevor Bain. We think about how who's fast on the restrictor plate tracks. Roush Fenway Racing, Ricky Stenhouse Jr. and Trevor Bain have shown a lot of speed. And look at the uh, front row cars running right with Trevor Bain. Those cars, their technology also comes out of Roush Fenway. So uh, sometimes we neglect to mention that they are teammates in effect with the six and the 17. And all, the, all of those cars are somewhat better this year, but they were so far behind. A little bit better doesn't show up that much. They got to get a lot better and I believe they got a good future ahead of using Matt Kenseth and some of these other resources. Well, isn't this track such a great equalizer? Uh, because all the little trick things you do on the mile and a half or the miles or the short tracks, they don't come into play here. No, Mike, it's the only race that anybody in the field goes to that thinks they might have a chance to win. Yep. It's an underdog race. Well, and that's why I love this stretch of about five or six races here. We have a short track. We have a one mile track, we have a mile and a half track, and we have a 2.66 mile super speedway. It's so diverse, and I think this is really where the drivers get tested, the teams get tested to the max. Well, and look, kind of get off on what's going on on the track a little bit. Look at Bubba Wallace. I mean, came in second at Daytona, and here he is. He's the third quickest car in the field right now in practice. And I tell you, it wouldn't surprise me one bit to see Bubba Wallace drive that 43 in the victory circle on Sunday. He can do it. I think he can too, DW. And I think he's got a lot of confidence here from Daytona. Something else I'm seeing, we saw this a little bit at Daytona. I'm seeing even more of it here at Talladega is the amount of draft and the way these cars pull up to the car in front of them with that spoiler so far down on the straightaways. I saw Michael McDowell just get this huge launch and run on the car ahead of him. That's something that we have not seen in a couple of years be this aggressive. 
Guys, I see a couple of drivers that left Daytona pretty happy right there. Austin Dillon in the three won the 500 back in February. Bubba Wallace finished second. Two totally different cars, though, because Austin Dillon's three car, it's in the Daytona experience. And remember, this is a brand new car for Bubba Wallace. Crashed past the start finish line after finishing second. Well, and I think what they proved with the 43 and Bubba Wallace, they give him a car that's a good race car, he'll drive the wheels off of it. 35 and a half to go in the first of two practice sessions today. So we Back at Talladega looking for win number six. God, I love this place. Let's go get and see what our uh, Betty's Garage Medallion Bank, Chevrolet Camaro Z01 has. Stay tuned. Peace out. <laughs> I mean, if he lose, I, 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 Bubba is so much fun. I just love talking to him, watching him. He's just having the time. He's having a great time out there driving his 43 car for the for the king. He has uh, run the most laps in this session of anybody. 13, working 14 now. He's kind of moving around. I don't know if he's doing that. Just get a feel for it. Or Hey, try to get it to he might be singing <laughs> yeah I'm singing. you know he likes to do that but he does have a good time doesn't he he does uh, uh, he might have been showing some other cars he was coming to pit road i think that's what it's probably going on a little bit wet we've seen Ooh. had some heavy rain here at talladega la uh, yesterday and oh, we're still yeah. seeing a little bit of that on pit road as these drivers try to uh, you know, make that pit road entry speed. But the weekend forecast is perfect. We are finally going to get ourselves a great weekend with no threat of rain that I've heard of. It's supposed to be severe clear. <laughs> severe clear. <laughs> okay. well, there's a lot of people down that infield. They are happy to hear that. Everybody yeah. wants to point to Chase Elliott as the leader of the youth movement into Talladega. The heir to the Pied Piper of Dale Jr. and the fellow who, like his dad, Million Dollar Bill, is going to uh, going to prevail here, especially now that he has tied Bill's mark of second place finishes leading up to his first cup victory. Talked to Chase early in the season. He was not excited about the prospects of tying <laughs> that mark. He wants to win. You know, we talked to Bill uh, earlier this year, and I, I, I can't help but remember what Bill told me. I said, you know, Bill, Chase just needs to be a little more aggressive. He said, D.W., let me tell you what happened. When he had that wreck at uh, Martinsville with Denny Hamlin, he said that woke him up. And he said, I think you're going to see a lot different driver in that car from now on. Oh. I think last week. You think back to last week. Yeah, he was real aggressive on those restarts. Oh, on those week. restarts, he picked up a bunch of spots. I, you know, I think there's a part of, and DW, you go back to when you first came in the Cup Series, there's, there's a part of you as a driver, maybe the first two or three years, you want to earn respect, right? You don't want to just come in there and start shoving and, and banging and, and making enemies. And I think that's the kind of driver that Chase Elliott is. He wants to come in and earn that respect of his competitors before he can start getting more aggressive with them. I agree. I think, though, there's a difference between respect and expect. Chase Elliott came in here in a top car with great expectations of everybody, especially the fan base, for him to succeed right away out of the box. Ricky Stenhouse, boy, he, he's been good on restrictor plate tracks. Now, real good. Real good. Yes. <laughs> I mean, he had to wheel this thing to win this race last year. But he's a wheel man. He is. Yep. You think Got Ricky that. Stenhouse Jr. is being a short track racer, and dirt track racer, but I'll tell you what, he's become a bit of a super speedway restrictor plate master here recently. Oh, well, he commanded the track until just the right moment. Got that big push from Casey Kane. Dropped down and passed Kyle Busch and held them all off. He did, and then you know what? Not only is he a great driver, but you have to have a really astute, great, paying attention spotter to make the kind of moves he made that last lap to get that lead and then to hang on to it to the line. Yeah, Mike Herman Jr. Give him a lot of credit to help with those wins that Ricky Stenhouse Jr. got. Yeah, I think that's the thing that makes the Penske guys pretty tough too. They've got Logano and uh, Keselowski both got two of the best spotters in the business, TJ Majors and uh, 
and then and Keselowski spotter. I mean, they're they're on they're on top of their spotting game. First, you have to have somebody that has a, a way of looking at the field in a way that they recognize things that are happening almost before they happen. Then they have to be able to communicate that to their driver. Then the driver has to have incredible confidence in those those words, those things that that spotter is saying. Trust. Got to have trust. And there are your spotters up on the roof as Jimmy Johnson and William Byron confer. Official one day fantasy sports partner of NASCAR. This weekend back with a $10,000 contest. You can play when you make your first deposit. Just download the DraftKings app. Sign up using promo code PITSTOP. 26 minutes to go in the first of two practice sessions. Now Jimmy Johnson and Darian Grubb talking things over. Drafting of a different sort here this weekend, Mike. No, yeah. no football drafting. This is all about aerodynamic drafting this weekend. Yeah, this is the big draft of the weekend come Sunday. Yeah. So I like uh, mile per hour drafting. Darian Grubb, the crew chief for William Byron, they're over there. He's talking to Jimmy Johnson, and I'm sure Jimmy. It's what I love about Matt Kenson coming back over to Rouse Fenway. You got to have a leader. You got to have a senior member in your team that you can go to, been here, done that, and can lean on and ask them for lean on and ask them for help and ask for information. And what can I do here? What can I do? What can I expect here? What can I expect there? So. I think that's really a good move for uh, for him to go over and talk to Jimmy Johnson. I agree, D.W. And I think William Byron just, he, I think his eyes were wide open in Daytona when he yep. went from the Xfinity car that has quite a bit of drag and downforce in it and grip in it, even on a restrictor plate, to the cup car and so little downforce that I think that now he's going to lean on his teammate, especially Jimmy Johnson, of, hey, what does this thing need to feel like in practice? Yeah, you know what I see in William Byron? Methodical. He doesn't, he doesn't make huge leaps and bounds. He makes little baby steps. And last week at Bristol, little baby step. Last week at Richmond, little baby step. He's getting a little better every week. So I'm going to let you fellas think on, if we had a draft, there's 40 drivers. Who would you draft to be your driver this weekend? And <laughs> while you ponder that, we'll check with Vince. And with Jimmy Johnson, a couple of time winner here at Talladega, running pretty well of late, a third and a six in back-to-back -back weeks. And then we saw you visiting with William and also uh, his uh, crew chief, Darian Grubb. What can you share with that group to help this transition for William be a little smoother his first time here in a cup car at Talladega? Yeah, there is some, but you know, to speak the confidence I have in William, I was trying to understand what his car was doing, not even going in a mentor position. It was just trying to see what he felt with the setup of his car and how it drove, and that same conversation with Darian. So I've been saying all along, I've been very impressed with William and Alex and um, the way that they've been able to just come into this this level of racing at the cup level and, and have such a feel for the race car. Sure, experience is helpful, and, and there will be lots of lessons learned along the way, but the, you know, especially William, well, all, all three of my young teammates, they all have a great, great sense of what their car is doing. Speaking of learning with the new uh, no ride height rule, how has that felt different for you uh, here at Talladega compared to what you've experienced in the past? They're moving. It's, it's pretty fast around here, so uh, this the they're going to roll back and run us over. Um, the uh, the speed's high, and you know from the way we race at Daytona with some of the rule changes here, um, it's important for us to get a good balance check. Um, not being able to move the track bar during the course of the race is, is going to greatly um, affect how aggressive we are with the setup with speeds. So uh, just trying to get a good read on things. Normally we don't draft in practice sessions, but we felt it was important to do so here, and um, things are off to a good start. Good insight. Thanks, Jimmy. Yep, very good. Uh, Darian Grubb has three restrictor plate wins with three different drivers. And uh, going for a fourth with William Byron this you know, weekend. Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Johnson. Yeah, he filled in for Chad Knauss for a Daytona 500 win. Yep, Tony Stewart and Denny Hamlin have gone you know, victory lane with Darian Grubb. Jeff, I remember Jimmy Johnson saying, when I got on these restrictor plate tracks when I first started, I was lost. I was making all the wrong moves, making all the mis making every mistake a driver could make. And then you and him, you set him down, and then you and him went out on the racetrack, and he said that one experience with Jeff teaching me what to do, when to do, and how to do, turned him out on my restrictor plate racing. What what can you what what did you tell him? Well, first of all, why did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean the drafting was different when, when Jimmy came to Hendrick Motorsports. You know, back back then it was all about building that momentum from behind. Still got a little bit of that, but you could be really aggressive with that. They didn't draft quite as fast and 
pull up as fast as they do now. Now it's about listening to your spotter, knowing where that big run's gonna come from. Back then, you'd create the run by using the brakes or letting off the throttle in the middle of the corner, back up to the front bumper of the car behind you and get a big shove to try to get that momentum. Okay, so uh, you taught him. Who taught you? <laughs> well, I just watched Earnhardt, yep. you know, by yep. watching Earnhardt Sr. And I used to always think, man, he's got something under the hood, something <laughs> under his foot. He's got some lever to do something because he's making passes by himself. I know. And I, and I started watching him a lot more, and I started realizing that he was backing up behind me or behind maybe the leader and he was doing something that was giving him that extra run. I thought at first it was just he was getting a draft off the car and, and had momentum. Then I started realizing that, that he was actually building that air, up, air pressure up from behind. Note the orange number on the roof of Clint Boyer's car. That is to aid spotter Brett Griffin uh, because three, I guess three of the four Haas cars this week look alike, Stuart Haas cars. And this is where the spotters stand up on top of the main grandstand in the middle of the tri-oval. So they are almost a mile away from the cars uh, at turn two and turn three. <laughs> Gonna earn their money on top of that roof this weekend. Spotters hard at work. As practice rolls on, Chevrolet is in four of the five fast spots right now. When we went to break, it was four, che four Chevys and a Ford in the Fast Five. Now the Toyotas have all gone out in a group, and, well, it's all changed. Jones and Truex at the top. Suarez fourth. Kyle Busch sixth. Hamlin seventh. And that all changes this time around because Austin Dillon of Newman have put the Chevys back on top over four Toyotas. 202 miles per hour. We heard Jimmy Johnson talk about wow. how fast they're drafting here at Talladega. That's fast. And that's a real fast. I remember coming here and trying to, we, we'd come here on a tire test and try to get a car to run 200 miles an hour. <laughs> do everything we knew how to do to get it to run 200 miles an hour. No, we didn't tow the car to the track that time. It was, <laughs> or drive it to the or track. Or didn't drive it either. And we didn't tie the doors closed with a belt. <laughs> All right, boys, you've had two segments to think on this. Yeah. Who would you draft to be your driver this weekend if you could pick from anyone in the field? You want to go first, D.W.? I, I, Obviously not. No, <laughs> but go ahead. I, 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 listen, do you know how old Trevor, uh, uh, Joey Logano is? 27. 27 years old. He's a young man. And if I was building a team or even for this weekend, he would be my choice. Joey Logano. Okay. Jeff? Uh, I tell you what. I, some people might not understand my logic here. I believe that Chase Elliott is ready to win, and I think that this is the place that he can get that first win. Larry Mack. Yeah, I'm going to stick with the Ford camp. I know he only has one win here, but I, I just, I, I'm going to go with Kevin Harvick. I just think the way they're running, period, right now, that's who I would take, I believe, Harvick. Um, I think the elephant in the room, <laughs> no disrespect. I gave this one to I know you did. <laughs> Jeff and I were talking during the break about Brad Kozlowski, and uh, I think if you go with the experience he has in winning at Talladega, I'll take Brad and Bernie says Joey Logano. And I'm surprised by that because Kozlowski has five wins, you know, here at Talladega. Right. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, Bernie kind of goes in there and looks at how stage racing's affecting things, laps led, where you're in the top 10. So Joey Logano's another great, great pick. Five out of seven. That's short odds, fellas. Heck, as good as Blaney ran in Daytona and his run here at Talladega, you could throw him right into the mix, too. Sure. Brad, by far the winningest active driver here at Talladega. Vince? Well, and as you guys look at uh, maybe the favorites, uh, if you're looking for a dark horse, I wouldn't count out this guy, Michael McDowell, who uh, had top 10 at Daytona. You got a little bit of drafting practice. You guys are done for this session, but how did the car feel in the draft compared to past trips here? You know, the cars do drive a little bit different with the no ro ride height rule. Uh, they're moving around quite a bit, but the Love Travel Stop Roller Bites Ford was pretty good, had good speed. Um, obviously, Super Speedway Racing is something we, we mark at uh, Front Row Motorsports, and uh, hopefully we can get our first win. It's your chance. Best of luck. You know, he'll be a factor. He will definitely be a factor here come Sunday. 
Michael McDowell, one of three drivers who've run the most laps so far. William Byron leading uh, this group right now. Casey Kane drops down. Here's William when he came in and talked about his first run today. It's like when I go through the transition, I don't have that load in the banking to really make me tight, and I'm just loose everywhere, walking the back of the car around, especially down the back stretch, but also in the triangle, especially once the guy got on my right rear. Hey, you feel like it's all aero or a twitchiness in the steering or anything? It's, um, it's all in the steering. It's all steering. I think that if there's any trouble spot here at Talladega, we don't talk about handling being a big issue, but through that tri-oval, we have seen some cars just lose it. Matter of fact, the 88 car, if you think about it, um, a couple years ago, just completely lost it in the draft through the tri-oval. There's not a lot of load there. We can see where the 24 is extremely aggressive on the skew to the left to try to get air off that rear spoiler. I think they might have to straighten that car up a little bit to give it a little more drivability. Larry? Yeah, we just watched Martin Trex Jr. in that 78 car. He left pit road and then rode around the apron and pulled back in the garage. The reason NASCAR said you cannot run because you're one of 12 drivers that will have to serve a 15-minute penalty for different inspection issues at Richmond last week. That would include Trevor Bain, Ty Dillon, Ross Chastain, Daniel Suarez, Eric Jones, Gray Galding, Michael McDowell, David Reagan, Kurt Busch, Jimmy Johnson, Timmy Hill, and Martin Tricks Jr. But we're riding with Ty Dillon. He was one of those penalty cars still out on the racetrack. Yeah, now, Larry, when they explained this procedure to us, they said that if a penalty car was on track at the 15-minute mark, they would black flag him. And there has been no black flag displayed. So we'll see what happens here. Ty Dillon, Daniel Suarez, couple of young guns, fastest. Ten and a half to go in a nice, clean, uneventful practice, just the way we like them here at Talladega. Don't worry, there'll be plenty of action on Sunday. Kyle Busch rolling off pit road and back out. He has the third fastest, actually tied for the second fastest individual lap with his teammate Daniel Suarez. But Mike, 202, the first uh, eight cars all over at 202, Johnson's at 200. Uh, so we have some incredibly fast cars. That's almost 203 on that uh, 13 car at Ty Dillon. And that was with about a seven car draft. Yeah. Imagine what's going to happen and how those speeds are going to be when we get a bigger group. There's A.J. Allmendinger coming down to pit road. Just think about how slow this is after you've been 200 miles an hour. Feels like you're crawling. Well, now he's <laughs> well below pit road speed here. This is the fastest pit road in the sport as far as what speed the drivers are allowed. Well, fastest racetrack. You got a big wide pit road. It's I our, think that makes sense. It's our biggest stage. 2.6 miles around this big joint. Joey Gase in the double zero this week. And he is 34th right now. Round two of the NFL draft live tonight on Fox. Troy Aikman, Joel Klatt will be in Dallas with all the big picks live tonight on Fox and on the NFL Network. A lot more fun to be had there. And here's Vince. With Trevor Bain, who had his best finish here last year, finished third, and uh, I just saw you a lot of time with the, the crew chief and the, the Ford folks. What did you think about your six? Yeah, uh, the six car is pretty fast this weekend. Uh, we expected that coming here to Talladega. Our Super Speedway program has been really good. Uh, Matt Fuchsia is not here right now. He had his baby girl uh, this morning, so congrats to him. But um, Kevin Kidd and Jimmy Finnick, I can't convince them that he's out of retirement, but they're uh, working on my car to get it dialed in for this, uh, this Sunday. Um, coming here to win, as always, you know, and um, I feel like I'm going to have a good opportunity with this Care forward. The big announcement at Roush this week involving uh, Matt Kenseth coming back to the team, which certainly has been received with, uh, with open arms from the NASCAR community, but maybe the person it affects in a negative manner could be you because that means you get out of the seat for some of those races. How, has, how do you reconcile that move of Matt coming back to Roush with how it impacts you? Yeah, that's a tough question, and I don't have an answer for you right now. As uh, much as I'd love to be able to talk to you about it, I'm just, uh, man, i got to keep my eyes on what's immediately in front of me, and that's 
driving this race car and getting a win out of it this weekend. Is it tough to keep the right frame of mind coming into this weekend after the news this week? I'm a competitive person and I want to be in the car every week. Uh, you know, that's my desire, always been my desire. Uh, but what do you do? Well done. Thank you. Thanks, Trevor. See Jimmy Fennick there. Uh, a big part of that super speedway program and a big part of several championships there uh, at Roush. Yep. He's uh, he he's been loving on those cars since Daytona in February. So from everything we hear a lot of credit goes to that guy for yes. their restrictor play program. Jimmy's a smart guy. Been around a long long time. Seen it all done it all. Bobby Allison's crew chief back in the day. Matt Kenseth. Matt Kenseth comes from up in Wisconsin. They're all buddies. They work close together through the years. Pretty good guy. Wouldn't mind having him on my team, shining on my car. I want to have him spread that love a little bit to some of those mile and a half tracks, too. <laughs> and, and I like what Trevor said. Uh, no, the news does not impact him positively of Matt Kenseth coming in to run some races in the sixth car this year, but he is focused on the job at hand. And he's at a track where he knows he runs well, has a good chance to shine. That's what it's all about for Trevor this weekend. Yes, I agree. They know they can win here. And now for something planned. <laughs> 193 by himself uh, for Kevin Harvick. Can you hear that engine is wide open all the way around? These are such big, wide sweeping corners with the back of the car that far down, spoiler out of the air. You're just not losing much RPM or speed even through the corners. When do you start to sniff a draft off, off that car ahead? Right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This, uh, we always said if you can see them, you, you, can, you you're can getting the draft. You yeah. can, if you can see a car in front of you, uh, which is pretty hard to do here, you're getting some effect. It may not be the full effect, but you are going to get a little bit of help, and you're going to feel it as you start to close on that car in front of you. You don't really start to feel it until you start to hear the RPMs creep up, and, yeah. and, and that's – Probably about maybe 10, 10, 12 car lengths. So. Yeah. You live and die by that tack. I mean, that tack is your speedometer, and you know if you're gaining or losing. All right, last lap for Harvick, 49.51. Let's see if he sniffed a draft off that car ahead. But you can see right there, just yes. going through the trial. Three tenths, just... three tenths faster than the lap before. And it'll be three tenths a lap faster this time. It might be four tenths this might time. He's getting closer. But I noticed as he went through the trial one, and it's not much of a corner, but just that little bit of input with the steering wheel, we saw the RPMs just kind of hover for a split second. And, and that's not unusual or different here, Mike. I remember winning this race lifting in the trial because huh? I was so loose. Wow. I had to get out of the gas in the trial because I was so loose. Can hear as he lifted off the throttle, that splitter hit the racetrack. That's that's what happens. That car, all the weight shifts. I think it's your rear bumper. <laughs> <laughs> Four and a half minutes to go in opening practice with Ty Dillon still fastest. Can't get enough NASCAR? Then don't miss NASCAR Race Up weeknights on FS1. This week, A.J. Allmendinger, Brad Keselowski, and Austin Dillon drop by to give their take on all the action from the weekend. And don't miss another installment of Women in Wheels starring Haley Deegan. That's all this week on NASCAR Race Up weeknights, 6 p.m. Eastern, only on FS1. NASCAR every day. On FS1, Kyle Larson looks like he's done for this practice. 17th. That's one cool kid right there. You know what? I mean, he got so much talent. He's he's done, but I didn't understand why he threw his helmet back uh, on. <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite sure of that. Uh, with only a minute to go, Alex Bowman has run the most laps in this session. He's on his 29th lap right now. I don't think we've, I think the Henry cars have all gotten their act together handle wise, but remember, wasn't too long ago that these cars were a handful in traffic and Dale Jr. spun out. Uh, several different people, different people that drove these cars. I mean, Chase Elliott spun out when these cars were in traffic. They weren't very happy. I think when teams find speed in a car, they rarely want to take it out, right? Uh, the crew chiefs, I think, and the engineers try to factor in how much of that that we have in qualifying. Do we need to pull out to race well? Well, here at Talladega, it's always been 
handling's no issue, handling's no issue. Well, we've seen here the last couple of years, it has been an issue. When you have to maneuver and make these big, bold moves from the outside lane to the inside lane, you need a car that's underneath you. You know why, Jeff? Because we're going faster. Yeah. I mean, we're probably, I don't remember being down here ever, uh, you know, in drafting practice, even being over 200 miles, 202, almost 203 miles an hour. And you can easily run four wide here during the race. So you have more lanes that you have to maneuver through or block in order to make those moves. I like the way he says easily, so casually. <laughs> <laughs> As we watch uh, Timothy Peters. And the flags come out. Ty Dillon has one opening practice. Four drivers get logged zero laps. Ross Chastain, Gray Galding, Timmy Hill, and Cole Witt did not practice. Chevy, three Toyotas, and a Chevy in the Fast Five to wrap things up for round one. DW, what is it you say? Hey, is that, is that smoke? No, it's just or a little water. water. Yeah, there's a little yeah. bit of Those water. Little that's, uh, oh, good. We some of the Much better. I mean, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's easy until it's something happened. Yeah. Until it's not. Right? Until, yeah. Until you run out of talent. <laughs> Sometimes your car will exceed your talent level. No, the Penske cars did not show speed in this practice. We just saw. Blaney going back to the garage. Legato 22nd, Keselowski 23rd, and Blaney 25th. Very deep in the field. There you see those weepers down at the bottom of the racing surface. Uh, something that did not go unnoticed during this practice. Entrance of pit road is so wet, I couldn't get you one on entrance. It's just too slick. Joey, can you uh, let whoever's on the spotter stand know how wet the entrance of pit road is? Maybe they can help us out for that for the next practice. Yeah, part of practice is not just going out on track and getting your heights right and see what kind of car uh, speed or handling your car has. It's also about attacking pit road to get a sense of are your heights right for that? Are the brake is the brake balance right? Where's my mark? You can't do that as long as that entry is wet like that. You see where that groundwater is coming from down at the bottom of the banking. Uh, you're going to have to dig up the state of Alabama to address that, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> Xfinity final practice is next, and then we'll be back at 2.30 Eastern time with Cup final practice. And the Arca Talladega race is here on FS1 today at 6 p.m.